Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, meet teenager Benjamin Schrader, also known as Commander Ben, invasive plant warrior. See why he's wielding his mighty sword of knowledge to protect native plants. On tour, the Benini Galleries and Sculpture Ranch connects international artwork to the hill country. Daphne makes her pick of the week, and John has your backyard basic tip. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Artwork in the garden takes on a unique dimensional quality. In Johnson City, the Benini Galleries and Sculpture Ranch bring together international sculptors against a hill country backdrop. Benini captivates the eye, imagination, and soul through profound art in several dimensions. Italian by birth, he's exhibited internationally since the 1960s. After he and wife Lorraine moved to Johnson City in 1999, they opened their own exhibits indoors and out as the Benini Galleries and Sculpture Ranch. Along with their personal collection and Benini sculptures, artists from around the world contribute to a public gallery against a hill country backdrop. Inside, step into Benini's gallery and adjacent studio where he paints through the night, thriving on four or five hours of sleep. In this gallery, you'll see about a 45-year span of his paintings. From the, it was about a 20-year time period, he painted the symbol of the rose. Then he went into the geometric period where he shaped the canvases, not in the traditional square corners, but shaped them according to the design. Now those are blended, hand-blended acrylics on canvas. From that period, he went into the more recent work, which are the abstracts. There's According Chaos in a Face of God series, which also includes the blended acrylics and then also dropped pigments. Benini and I met in Gainesville. I was at the University of Florida, completing my master's degree there in journalism and communications, and I was sent to interview him. He's fond of saying the interview ain't over yet, <laughs> but we've been together 30, about 35 years. They moved to the Hill Country Ranch, once owned by President Johnson, for us 147 acres that distanced Bandini from distractions. But it was the view that sold them. It was a, a tremendous reason for us to come here, the high up on the, the mountain where our home is. We came for privacy at the time. It gave us a lot of serenity. Bandini felt that the Texas Hill Country it reminded him a lot of the Mediterranean region where he was born. He liked that. We got involved in this project, sort of a circuitous route, because we started placing sculpture that we owned on the property. Then they opened the outdoor gallery to their friends from around the world. We allowed them to pick spots on the ranch for the placement. Many sculptors have a studio where they create the work, but perhaps not a place to showcase it. The sculptors love their work outdoors. Going outside is totally different. Mother Nature is there with all her impositions and all of her beauty. To share that experience with the public, they opened the Sculpture Ranch on selected days, free of charge. Seeing them at different times of the day, different times of the year, they, they change, they respond to the weather, the sunsets behind them, the birds landing on them. We've had a number of birds build nests in the sculpture, so there's an interaction of nature, you know, with art and the human element plus Mother Nature that is ever-changing every day. And the difference of the pieces in nature, it's all quite fascinating. When a sculptor arrives, they all tour the ranch to find the most resounding location and orientation to its background. One difference from an indoor gallery is mounting that's sturdy enough to withstand occasional fierce winds that whip around the mountain. Many of the sculptures are for sale. A lot of them we own, and of course those are not for sale. We do not require commission from these sculptors. Having said that, many of them insist on returning something. By the same token, Benini doesn't want to make money off of any other 
artist. So we have an arrangement that if they choose to return something, we put, and we kept that, we put it in an acquisition fund, and any of those funds that accumulate, we use that and we buy one of their sculptures. In drought, when springtime wildflower peepers don't have much to see, there's always a blue bonnet at the ranch. Every season paints a different native plant background with a few surprises from resident wildlife. Benini's indoor galleries frame another experience that documents his journey as an artist. This is more like a big cavern and I have people walk in here and they say this is like a temple of art and there's a serenity here. Some people come for hours and they stay here, and that's fine. It's almost spiritual if they choose that. They have their own relationship with the, the work and the space. He works with acrylics very, very early on in the late 50s and early 60s. He painted with some oils in Italy. That's all they had in Italy at that time. When Benini arrived in the States, he discovered acrylics. They engaged him with their color brilliance and permanency. To this day, he does a blending process. No airbrush, he hand blends. But his technique requires high humidity and low temperatures. When it gets really hot and really dry, he can't pull those, those paints like he needs to. And even then, he's, he's working with seconds because any artist who's worked with acrylics know as quickly as you're putting them down, they're trying to dry on you. Benini doesn't use the retarders, but he, he goes after that really, really, the essence, that, that color brilliance. And so he works just with the humidity and the temperature. He'll work in a studio with humidifiers going and cold temperatures, but even then, you know, sometimes it's problematic. The last couple of summers have really in, encouraged us to look where he might have cooler climates. As Benini and Lorraine explore their next destination, the property is up for sale. Still, their voyage to the hill country will live on. It's been a pleasure to introduce art to a lot of the school systems, to a number of people who perhaps haven't had access to art in the way that some of us in the cities have had. I mean, some of these ranchers who have walked in and they weren't quite sure what was here. That some of them stood at the doorway and as polite as could be and tipped their hat and howdy ma'am, may I come in? And it's been such a pleasure, you know, to share something different, you know, with them and, and then to have them come back with their families, you know, what a compliment. Benini's not only been generous with his land, he's given his time to countless students, encouraging the next generation of artists. This gives them an opportunity to see the journey of one artist and they can ask anything they want and they can learn what worked for him. One of the things he tells them always though is read, read, read. He's a strong advocate of, of the importance of reading and studying what came before in the history of art. We have probably 25,000 books on the property, different libraries on, on the property and he, he stresses the importance of reading and the importance of trying different materials, finding your own voice, finding your own style. Well, we're moving from the Benini Sculpture Gardens to Commander Ben. Uh, ben is our theme today, if, if it seems like it here on Central Texas Gardener. Uh, we have a wonderful young guest here joining us. He's Commander Ben, and uh, this remarkable young man has uh, created a website and uh, undertaken kind of a war against invasive plants, and uh, we're here to celebrate you, Ben. Welcome to the program. I'm so happy to be here. It's <laughs> going to be really fun. Well, tell me how you got started uh, on, in this war against invasives. Well, how I really got started was I had a science fair project, mm -hmm. uh, I think back when I was 12, so mm -hmm. uh, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to really do something that no one else had ever done before. And uh, I have very severe dyslexia, so my dad was reading me the newspaper. And he was reading about these plants that were invading our native ecosystem. And I was thinking, my goodness, these terrible invasives, <laughs> these, it's a bad of good versus evil in nature. <laughs> and so I said, I really want to help the good guys win. Uh, so I really started with doing my science fair project on invasive species and the problems that they caused. Okay, and so what did the science fair project entail? Well, it entailed 
uh, what the giant reed was exactly doing to our native ecosystems. Uh, the giant reed, that's a bad one, yeah. Oh, it is, it is. <laughs> and the reason I picked that one was mm -hmm. uh, uh, I thought it would be an easy one for me to find mm -hmm. as my first invasive because it's quite large, yeah, being right. the giant yeah. reed. You could, you, would, you could see it from the roadside a mile away. <laughs> yes, <right>? sir. <laughs> Right, so you, and so you you studied that, and 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 what what did you find? And well, I really found that there's certain plants that seem to be closer to the giant reed, and I mm -hmm. used the Texas Invasives database mm -hmm. to sort of figure that out. Okay, and uh, one of them was English ivy, mm -hmm. and uh, different ligustrums and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the different removal methods. Now I didn't know as nearly much mm -hmm. about invasives as I do now. Right, uh, but back then uh, a lot of great ones were either controlled burning or hand removals, but the real key with those plants is they're very difficult to remove because of the vegetative root masses oh, yes. called rhizomes, mm -hmm. which uh, if you don't get out all of it, it'll come right back. Right, right, and that's a, a, a common concern to area, gar area gardeners when dealing with weeds. Leave just a fragment of a plant, and sure enough, it's gonna come right it back. It comes on. back with a thousand of them. <laughs> exactly, so, uh, right. Yes, sir. So uh, why does this matter to you, Ben? Why, why did you feel that urgency about the native plants? Well, I really, I've always loved our native ecosystem mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. And I really saw that these invasives were just destroying it. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a web of interdependence where everything counts on each other. And invasives are like a scissor. And they're coming and they're cutting all the different strings in that web. And it's going to come crashing down if we don't stop them. So we really have to work together as an army of 10,000 invasive hunters <laughs> to stand against invasives. <laughs> and I really, mainly what I focus on is really educating kids about mm -hmm. invasives so mm -hmm. that we can really, as the next generation, mm -hmm. really focus on taking down these very problematic plants. Mm -hmm. You know, I always feel obligated when I'm out in nature hiking somewhere. If I see, for example, like a Nandino growing out in the middle of the, sh uh, the hill country, <laughs> I feel obligated to snap it. <laughs> I, I know you just have to uh, when I'm out filming. Right. Uh, invasive uh, different videos that mm -hmm. I do on my blog, commanderben.com. Mm -hmm. I always mm -hmm. am like, oh my goodness, I just wish I could take all those, these invasives right. down right. when so, I was there. So I'm envisioning your your army of 10,000 young people out there getting the, <laughs> the privet out of the, All in the, Taekwondo the, uniforms. Right, <laughs> that, that's awesome. So let's talk about how you're spreading the word. Well, how I mainly spread the word is through my blog and YouTube mm -hmm. channel. Mm -hmm. I also do Twitter and all sorts of different things to really get the word about invasive species out there. Mm -hmm. I also give talks and mm -hmm. uh, go around to the different invasive meets to meet people, be there, and uh, learn about the latest technology in defeating invasives. Okay, and uh, let's, how successful have you been in terms of recruiting folks to, the, to your army? Well, I, I'd say I've been extremely successful oh, because great. every person that we get, mainly what I do is education. Mm -hmm. So every person who knows that invasives are out there, because a lot of people don't even know that they exist. They just mm -hmm. think of, I mean, I was like that way before. I, all plants were plants. They've just, yeah. they're there. Right, right. And I never really thought about that there are, are native plants, which are really good and standing with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are these invasive plants that are just destroying everything. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, really, Every person uh, that's educated about it is one step closer to defeating invasives. Okay. Uh, and so any time I educate a person is a great okay. victory. Okay, so you have this army of folks. What are their weapons? What's the weapon in this war? Well, our main weapon is social media, mm -hmm. which is getting people educated about it. Okay. As I was saying, and I guess other weapons are uh, weed pullers and big, just big <laughs> loppers, loppers. <laughs> yeah. uh, saws, and all sorts of things mm -hmm. to uh, push out those invasives. Yeah, and you know, and you, we mentioned the fact that often it's you, you think you've done a plant in by cutting it to the ground. Uh, but it regrows. But the truth is, if and, and this is true in a home garden setting, is you if you are persistent about cutting it down, eventually you will triumph. <laughs> right. it, it will run out. It won't be able to pull in enough uh, mm -hmm. vitamins and water, and eventually right. it will just run out and die. But I've heard of a few cases with golden bamboo mm -hmm. where the people actually covered the area with concrete <laughs> where it had been just to keep it away. But, uh, uh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's funny. Kind of, right. Well, golden bamboo is one of the worst of the invasives. Let, let's talk about some, what are, the, what are the primary enemies? We've talked about giant reed, 
Golden Bamboo, obviously. You but mentioned Nan English Ivy. It's Nandina, as you Nandina, said. yeah, it's a bad one in our area. What, what else should people be thinking about it? not planting in their garden because it's just going to help, you know, pop, you know, take over our native landscape. Well, there's a bunch of ones, a bunch uh -huh. sort of a core that has mm. really been a problem. One of them is elephant ear that mm. people plant a lot uh, for decoration. Mm -hmm. Another, and I was actually at Home Depot and I was horrified when I saw all <laughs> these English ivy pods right, right. Uh, with the different ones and I was like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, English ivy is another one because it grows so fast and, but it's great for ground cover and walls and that's mm. why people buy it, right. but they don't realize that it's going to escape mm -hmm. and when it breaks off it can regrow and it's just a real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, all the Ligustrums, uh, doesn't matter uh, any kind of them, the privets and the, the privets, Ligustrums. Yeah, are especially disgusting. Uh, yes, <laughs> those especially disgusting. They are super problematic yeah, and right. it's so easy for them to get into areas mm -hmm. uh, where they don't belong because right. their seeds uh, can wash down in the rain and do all sorts of things mm -hmm. and spread like wildfire. Right. Uh, Tree of Heaven is another mm. really bad one yeah. that some people plant, and uh, I believe Chinese Tallow Tree. Yeah, right. And uh, there's China berries. Oh, there's we could be here all day right. just naming right. bad invasives. There's right. a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Well, uh, you know that I think that you, your enthusiasm for the removal is is awesome. Uh, now, what else can people find on your website? What what other kind of information do you have available for people? Well, I have a lot of great resources on my website. Mm -hmm. uh, a big thing, the biggest thing I focus on is invasive species and mm -hmm. just educating people about the problems they cause and little fun stories mm -hmm. uh, that go along with that. I also really cover many science topics. I partnered with Hot Science Cool Talks, uh, which mm -hmm. is actually done at UT, and I have everything from uh, space uh, to all sorts of uh, great topics. Mm -hmm. And only recently have I expanded about talking with my person about talking about my personal journey with dyslexia, and uh, doing the same thing I have with invasives to help educate and help people with that as well. Well, that's awesome. Tell me some of your favorite victory stories. <laughs> if, if you're if you're fighting all these wars, you've yes, you've, sir. you've probably had some victories that made you feel especially proud. My absolute favorite victory story. Uh, is my titanic struggle <laughs> I named the post. So it was a really great one. Uh, and it was actually, I believe it was Ligustrums mm -hmm. that had surrounded this beautiful oak tree and they had all grown up around it and literally had encased it. It was amazing mm -hmm. to see how they literally had grown their own trunk oh, yeah. around they the get, oak they tree. They get to be sizable trees and you often find them in colonies underneath the beautiful oaks. Yes. Because the birds eat the berries from the Ligustrums and, and they, they perch they go in the, the oak. bathroom. And then, right, and they plant the seeds, so to speak. I uh, said like a pooky gentleman, <laughs> sir. Uh, but yeah, so we cut all around it, and then uh, we came. Uh, I believe we went back twice to then mm. yank out mm -hmm. uh, what was there, and the oak tree had some scarring, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it would make it. I was very happy. That was one of my greatest victories, was saving that guy. Well, and a magnificent native local oak is something to savor and a great victory to be had. And uh, so what is your next adventure for Commander Ben? I know you're, you work with the Wildflower Center, and so. I, there's so many adventures, mm -hmm. uh, so many different paths to take and mm -hmm. my biggest adventure is I'll be starting high school. Uh, I've been homeschooled <laughs> all my school. life okay. so uh, it should be a really great experience. But yeah I'd say with Commander Ben there's so much, mm -hmm. uh, so many adventures mm -hmm. uh, to take and so many great things that are going on. Well you, I will say that you give me hope uh, for that the generation that you represent that we will win some of these environmental wars that are so important to us. So thank you for the work that you're doing, Commander Ben. My pleasure, sir. Thank you for the work you do at educating so many people about so many great topics. Well, it's, it's been a genuine pleasure having you here. We wish you every best of luck. And again, I hope that everybody will visit you at commanderben.com. And uh, coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our question this week comes from Drew, who has a suffering cedar elm. The tree was native to the lot when his house was built a few years ago and was one of the reasons that he chose to buy the house. But after the drought set in, the tree seemed to struggle, putting on fewer leaves each year. Drew wants to know if the tree is a hazard and should be cut down. Well, aside from its increased decline, the tree actually looks quite stable. And since there are no structures nearby and the limbs are so small, if one breaks, it's not likely to hurt anyone or cause any damage. The wounds on the side of the tree occurred a very long time ago, and the tree's healed the best it can. 
You'll notice some holes, likely caused by borers in the heartwood, but these are also old wounds. Trees growing in nature normally grow much more closely to their neighbors than they do in a landscape where we plant them all alone. So in nature, trees tend to be thinner and taller than they do when we plant them in wide open areas with lots of space and no nearby competition for sunlight. When trees are cut down to build homes, but a few are left to enhance the appeal of the lot, the trees left behind may struggle with the removal of their neighbors. And if the root zone's not protected, heavy equipment can compact the soil and cause the tree to decline. With Drew's tree, there's another complicating factor, mistletoe, which is a parasitic plant that will eventually kill the tree. The infestation of mistletoe here is quite thick, so I'm sorry to tell you, Drew, your cedar realm is not long for this world. But the good news is, it's pretty small, so it shouldn't be too hard to cut down. Small conciliation, I know. Our plant this week is rock rose, Pavonia lassiopetala. This tough little native beauty usually gets about two feet tall, but can get much taller. And it spreads nicely, filling out to around three feet wide. Pavonia is covered with pink blooms all summer long, even through the brutal 100 degree stretches that we see so often these days. The flowers are very simple, with five large petals and a distinct central column formed by the fused pistil and yellow stamens. The rock rose flower might remind you of the larger flowers of a hibiscus, and for good reason. They're both in the same plant family, the Malvaceae, better known as the mallow family. Rock rose is native to rocky, disturbed soils, hence its name, so be sure that it gets plenty of drainage in your garden. And it's a prolific reseeder, a strategy that ensures its continued existence through tough times. But if planted in flower beds that you prefer to remain nice and tidy, you'll be spending a fair amount of time pulling errant rock rose seedlings. So you may want to put this plant in a more natural, free-form area of the garden. Pavonia thrives in sun, but can be perfectly happy in part shade. And with just a little bit of supplemental irrigation, maybe once a week or so during the driest times, it keeps right on growing through our awful heat. It does tend to wilt during the day, but that doesn't mean that it needs water. You'll notice that it's right back to its cheery self the next morning without any irrigation at all. Rock rose is also prone to powdery mildew, but just ignore it. The plant certainly does. You remember last spring, Hella Wagner shared pictures of her century plant that bloomed and then sadly died. She replaced it with a soft leaf yucca that already had a gorgeous flower on it in June. And like all yuccas, this plant will be around to bloom again next year and for many years to come. I know that it doesn't feel like it, but summer, the end of summer is right around the corner, so it's time for garden maintenance. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit us at klru.org ctg with your questions and plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgul. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Maybe you go out of town now and then, three days, even up to seven days or so, and you need to take care of your house plants. Maybe someone comes over for you now and then. You may not need that. You may be able to take care of them just by putting them in a container and um, grouping them all in there. You know, if you put water into the bottom of the container, it may be too wet for that period. We don't need it to be that wet. And so one of the things that we can do is to put them in the container let me show you this little ficus. This is a great house plant right here. And so this little ficus goes in there and all around it, I've already done this, but we take some newspaper and then wad it up like that, stuff it in. We stuff it in everywhere. You can see that it's all in between all of the plants in there. And so the next thing to do in order to keep them nice and moist, first you water the plants and then you put this in there and it insulates it also. And so what I'll do is just wet them down each time and um, I'm not overfilling the bottom. There may be a little bit of water down there, but not all that much. And so this is a very good way. You gotta keep it in the right light though. So near a window would be uh, the way you had them before. You may as well put it back in that spot. Nice containers of different types are available at different stores. And I think that um, putting your house plants in something like this, makes sure that they're in good shape when you get home. These plants are great house plants. This is the Ficus elastica, a very good one. And this is the Neanthabella, one of my favorite little palms. And uh, this is a dwarf one. So it does very, very well in the house and grows very nicely. I put the paper in there, a little bit of moisture. They're all wet and um, I can leave them alone. Put them by the window, don't hide them. Some people do something like this in a bathtub, that's fine, but getting all that paper wrapped around them and insulating them a bit is a little bit more challenging in a big container like that although your big house plants can do very well in there.
So that's a real neat way to do this. Let me show you something else. Sometimes your plants have been distressed for whatever reason and um, there's a way to revitalize them or actually feed them a little bit. Now we've used compost in many other areas out in the garden, on the trees, on the roses. It's good on houseplants too. You don't need to brew it a whole lot. What we do is we take a little bit of your homemade compost, that's the best one you can find, and uh, you can see some down there with that little teaspoon. We will use three teaspoons in this uh, combination right here. So we put it in there last night and then we let it sit, make the extract, but it has the compost in there. And in order to spray it, I've got to get that out of there or it'll clog. Now this comes from a paint store really nice. You could use a coffee filter if you had enough to hold it in there. And so I will pour this in here. The compost particles stay on top and you can see the tea that's coming out of the bottom. So this makes a little tea. It's an extract of the nutrients that are in the compost. And then the next thing is you take that and pour it into your sprayer. So now we have it in here and you can use this on any plants, whether they're on the porch or uh, inside the house, they all benefit from this little compost spray. So it's not just outdoors. And so we'll go through here and uh, just a light mist also. And underneath, you know, you can get rid of red spider that might be accumulating down there, but you get nutrients and the plants just kind of come back to life. And so that's a real good idea to do. Well, for Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgool. I'll see you next time. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and like us on Facebook. Next week, bring on the butterflies with the National Butterfly Center. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.